my talk. My name is Johannes Thumsen and I'm working with Anasusa Labs uh, as a kernel developer for storage. Um, today's talk is uh, some 5,000 feet overview of the Linux block I.O. layer. Small agenda, we'll start a bit with the I.O. architecture, the architecture of the, the whole I.O. stack, then the scalability issues that came from this architecture, I explain the principle between the old single queue block layer and the new fancy multi queue block layer, and one common misconception between the difference between multiple queues and what's actually the, queue, the depth of a queue with SCSI, T secure, or serial ATA and secure. So, first, very, very simplified diagram of the I.O. stack. Uh, your application does a write into the virtual file system or maybe does an M map and write directly into the buffer cache. This then goes to the file system, to the block layer, and either directly to a device driver or to the SCSI mid layer, from the SCSI mid layer, then to the SCSI driver or to your serial ATA layer, and from the serial ATA layer to the driver, and then eventually it's some when hit a disk. So every request will get into a per process plug list that has an energy analogy of a kitchen sink or a bathtub uh, where all requests or all data is filled in onto a specific level and then the plug is pulled and the request is drained. It goes to an I.O. scheduler and currently we have three of them. The first very basic I.O. scheduler is a no-op. It's basically just a FIFO, does nothing much, just kick out the requests. The next possible I.O. scheduler would be a deadline scheduler. It uh, prefers reads over writes because usually a read is a synchronous action, whereas a write is an asynchronous action. And when a specific deadline is reached or there are too many requests queued, it sends it out or then there's this highly sophisticated, completely fair queuing I.O. scheduler that does I.O. accounting, a lot of merging, etc. And then it goes all to dispatch queue and then to be processed by the lower levels. Uh, yeah, there some scalability issues arose because nowadays you don't have one extremely fast CPU anymore, but a lot of CPUs that are yeah, somewhat fast. And that they all can run parallel applications in parallel that hit in parallel the file system, go into the block layer and then have to be queued. And to enqueue it, you have to take a lock. So, and this lock contented a lot, and then there's one single queue down to the drivers, and you had a lot of lock contention and lost a lot of time. This was okay in the times with rotating disks, where a seek costed some milliseconds, and it's okay to burn some thousand CPU cycles because hardware is slow. But nowadays with SSDs, especially NVMe disks, this isn't the case anymore. So there had to be done something to get away of this lock contention. This is when the multi queue block layer came up. Uh, it has not one per system queue anymore, but one per CPU queue. So you can submit all your I.O. in parallel, 
have nearly no global state anymore over the I.O. There's no more lock contention. All's fine and dandy. Uh, these software queues then get mapped to hardware queues because some new hardware like NVMe, some fiber channel adapters, actually expose multiple queues to the host OS. So you can queue into the hardware in parallel, like some network drivers, some, some network devices do that as well. And every I.O. that is dispatched triggers an interrupt somewhere when the I.O. is done. And these I.O.s get handled, hopefully, on the CPUs that did the submission, so everything is still cache hot. And there's a lot of reduction between interprocessor interrupts. So the memory is uh, it's still on the node where the memory of this request was. Oh, quite too fast. Um, but there's a drawback. We have no I.O. scheduler currently in this model. So with slow disks like rotating rust, uh, there is no scheduler. There's nothing that stops the I.O. from flooding out uh, to do disk seeks, etc. So it might not be the best way for every kind of I.O., for every system. That's the reason why you can turn it on or off via the kernel command line. In SCSI, we have the SCSI MQ, use block MQ uh, kernel command line parameter. You can switch to yes or no, depending on what uh, host bus adapters you use. And for a common misconception between what is actually multi queue, what is single queue, what's this NC queue that the serial ATA in AHCI disks have? In the classical single queue model, you had one request that got dispatched to the drive. When the drive is done writing this I.O., it triggers an interrupt. It's acknowledged the next I.O. can be dispatched. In the TCQ, NCQ model, you can dispatch multiple requests to the drive. Uh, serial ATA NCQ has 31 requests you can queue. Every request gets a tag, like a unique cookie to identify the tag. The drives generate an interrupt when the I.O. is done, and then the, the block layer can look up the tag, which tag is completed. The drive can reorder all the requests uh, so to its own convenience. So there's no guarantee that if you write 1, 2, 3, 4, that the interrupts come in the sequence of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but maybe 4, 2, 3, 1, depending on the seek of the drives, etc. And then in the multi queue setup, you have yeah, multiple queues that have a specific depth, like uh, the NVMe drives specify the, the NVMe spec says there can be up to 64K queues in parallel, and each queue can be up to 64 can have up to 64K slots. So you have 64K times 64K possible requests pending. And each of these queues can be assigned to a CPU or an application or whatever the administrator likes. Usually it's, an, it's assigned to a CPU. Uh, so if you have I.O. from 72 CPUs on a server running down on your NVMe drive, then they should all fly in parallel until they contend on your PCI Express bus, because you don't have 72 lanes there. 
um, for a tagging. I know how many people of you know the concept of pack DHCP on some like Chaos Computer Camp. Uh, in the old days, DHCP was very unreliable, and they invented something called pack DHCP where they used packs and wrote your host part of your IP address on it so you can stick it on your uh, cables to know which IP address you had and the admins knew uh, which DHCP lease was out. Um, this is the, that's the same concept uh, with the request tagging. We just have an address for each request. We stick a tag to it. To it. The drive completes, tells us, yeah, request number five got completed. So the block layer and the drivers know, okay, this request got completed. I don't have to retry it. We can tell the file system, okay, it's written out. It's written out. Your data should be safe. Now, not all hardware has multiple queues, or not all hardware has as much queues as your you have CPUs. Like HCI has one queue, but it is 31 slots deep, and your common notebook has like four or eight CPUs. So you still can use your multi queue block layer. It goes down until the low-level device driver in parallel, then gets mapped to the hardware queues. It's not that interesting with, yeah, HCI with only one queue, but it's kind of interesting with low-end NVMe drives that maybe have four or eight hardware queues, but you, on the desktop system, have maybe 16 CPUs, eight hardware queues on your drive, so there's an easier way of mapping your requests down from the software queues to the hardware queues. Yeah, and I was way too fast. <laughs> so at least more time for questions. Any questions? Nope. <laughs> Test. There's been an ongoing debate in the internet about the comparison of the Windows NT kernel I.O. and the Linux kernel I.O. And many argue that the asynchronous I.O. implementation of the NT kernel is much better, especially the so-called overlapping I.O. they can use there. What's your point of view on that? I unfortunately have no idea what's over over the Windows NT kernel. Sorry, not my business. Closed source OS, can't look in it, into it. But Oli maybe knows. One question, if you have a software device like a RAID array or a caching solution, where is the queue? For the hardware device or is there one for the software device? Uh, your RAID arrays are above the block layer. They're bio-based, so they're not request, usually, no, they're request-based. No, it's software solution, not the hardware RAID arrays. MD rate or DM rate. They're bio based. That's above the block layer. That's directly, these are block devices, but they get the BIOS and then. Um, in context with this, um, how is the I.O. queuing if you assemble different hardware devices within a soft rate? For example, a local disk and the iSCSI disk. How is this queuing done then? Yeah, on the, on the lower levels, these are for the lower level drivers. These are just the disks. Low level drivers don't know if they are in a RAID array. 
on your serial ATA, iSCSI, whatever SCSI driver, you don't know what the upper layers did. So if you have a RAID, uh, there are multiple requests dispatched. Every request is dispatched in parallel to the lower level drivers, and these then dispatch it. So the, they have no idea what's over, what's going on in the upper layers of the stack. And they don't need to. Because the upper layers of the stack have been uh, completely parallel since the dawn of time, or since the abandonment of the big kernel lock, at least. No more questions? Then I think we are done.